we're going to start the presentation out with a short video um, from the U.S. Forest Service talking about the home ignition zone. So I'm going to go ahead and play that for you right now. Uncontrolled extreme wildfires are inevitable. These are the conditions when wildland urban interface disasters occur. The hundreds to thousands of houses destroyed during wildfire. Does that mean that the wildland urban interface disasters are inevitable as well? No. We have great opportunities as homeowners to prevent our houses from igniting during wildfires. Most of our perceptions are that these big wildfires are something we can't do anything about. They're overwhelming. If huge organizations can't control the wildfire, how is it that somehow I can do something to my house to keep it from burning down? It's not a matter of controlling the wildfire. It's a matter of changing those conditions of the house and its immediate surroundings. There's a lot that we can do to the little things to our house and its immediate surroundings in order to reduce the ignition potential of that house. I'm going to do an assessment on this house for its ignition vulnerabilities. The assessment is what all of us homeowners can do. Currently, we're not in fire season, but it's getting hot and it's getting dry. So this is a perfect time before the smoke's in the air to do this assessment. The great opportunity we have as homeowners is that we can do the little things around our house to keep our home from igniting. We can actually separate our house from the extreme wildfire. We don't have to rely on the control of the extreme wildfire in order to keep our house from burning down. Over the last 30 years, my colleagues and I have done research involving laboratory experiments, field experiments, and post-fire disaster assessments to, to quantify and qualify the relationship between a wildfire and a destroyed home. What we found is that the high intensity flames more than 100 feet away from the house are largely incapable of igniting the house directly. It's the little things that seem to be destroying the houses. The burning embers, the, we call them firebrands, lofted out of the high intensity wildfire to land in the community, sometimes directly on houses as well as the surroundings. It's not 100 foot flames, it's a pile of firebrands that would fit in the palm of our hand. So my colleagues and I designed a firebrand, an ember shower demonstration. We have a full-size house. It's got bark mulch and pine needles around the base. It's got pine needles in the rain gutters. It's got pine needles on the roof. We have an ember generator that then casts a brand blizzard at this house. In order for those firebrands to be effective in igniting the house, they either have to ignite the house directly or they have to ignite something around the house that then can spread to the house. The main factors determining this home's ignition potential are right here. The home's characteristics related to its immediate surroundings. For our assessment, our perspective changes to this house being one of fuel for. Okay, welcome back. So you saw in that video how the home in relation to the wildland um, can ignite and how the direct flame impingement from the wildfire isn't necessarily what is contributing to 
a home surviving a wildfire, but the ember shower that is coming off of the vegetation can produce. And of that, a lot of that comes down to the vegetation management, the vegetation that we have in our surrounding area. And so <clears throat> we go into the home itself and things that we can do in the home. There are new building codes that are because of this information. There are um, new products that can go on a home. And we're going to go over some of that stuff when we look at, you know, what, what is the home ignition zone? So let me share this next slide with you. So when you look at what is the home ignition zone? So <clears throat> this is your home. And what we're doing is we're breaking your home down into several zones. So we have your structure and then we have the immediate zone. And there's a lot of things in your structure itself that we can address. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those in a bit. So the immediate zone is that zero to five feet. So you saw in that video, they talked about up against the structure, they showed a flower bed. Most homes, most people have some type of ornamental vegetation or flower bed. And there's, they simulated by putting some bark and some pine needles to represent some of the leaf litter um, and some of the landscaping choices people make in that first five feet. From there, we go out to the next zone, which is our intermediate zone, which is our five to 30 feet from the house. And so what we're looking for in that five to 30 feet for vegetation. And then from there, we're gonna go out one more zone to the extended zone, 30 to 100 feet and kind of what that looks like. So as you see here in our demonstration photo here, really what we're emphasizing on this immediate zero to five feet zone is having no flammable vegetation. And so we're looking at doing more hardscaping. So those flower beds that you have, flowers and wood chips, we're looking at removing the wood chips, removing some of that vegetation and replacing it with some non-combustible options such as rocks or hardscape with pavers, um, something of that look. Um, we just want to eliminate that flammable vegetation up against the structure. Because once we get something in that zero to five feet that's on fire, and we're then transferring a lot of that heat, whether it's going to be direct flame impingement or even radiant heat, if it's not touching the structure, is going to be transferring to whatever our siding is um, or our windows or maybe it's uh, up against our wooden uh, patio cover. So we want to eliminate the flammable vegetation in that. Working out into our, our intermediate zone, our 30 feet, that's where we wanna start doing some of our landscaping. So you'll see in the photo, we have a few shrubs uh, that are spaced out. So that's really important when we go into planting is spacing some of our vegetation away from each other and out. So you'll see in that 30 feet, we have our trees and that's where we have our first trees and, and we want to have our trees spaced out. Um, you know, there are a lot of places where we look at our trees and they're so tightly packed together because when we planted them originally, we spaced them out for what was appropriate for the size of the tree probably we, we planted. So we bought a box tree that was 12 feet tall and we put them roughly 10 feet apart. The crowns were touching because they were small trees. Now, fast forward 20 years, these trees have grown quite a bit. They're now 60, 70 feet tall, possibly. And we have our crowns basically coming in and growing together. And so when we're looking at this, we want to have an open crown spacing so that if you had one tree that did get impacted by fire, that tree could burn without the fire having a continuous fuel source to the next tree, to the next tree. Could the tree next to it catch on fire from the radiant heat? Um, yes, it could potentially, but it probably won't. Um, could it take embers? Possibly. But we want to just give that spacing away from the trees. And then as we work out of our intermediate zone, that's where we can start to get a little bit more vegetation. So the way I look at it is it's just layering. So in our first layer, we, we don't have any vegetation. Our next layer, we start to minimize the amount of vegetation we have. 
our third layer is where we can have a little bit more and going out from there. And so this program talks about going out to 100 feet. You know, some properties that's completely feasible and people can can do that. Other properties, you might only be able to influence 15 feet and that's fine. It's just in that 15 feet, we should make those smart choices. So when it comes down to our vegetation that we're having in that five feet, that's pretty important too. Like what do we have growing in there? We want, and there's, there's, I can um, tune you into a, a lot of good links. If you just go to Google is one of the best resources and Google some of the vegetation choices um, on defensiblespace.org on the Cal Fire website. You'll 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 read about plants that you should plant and plants that you should not have planted um, next to your structures. And I want to share a, a quick video as we talk about trees and you know manicuring your trees um, is very important around the Malibu area. We have a lot of eucalyptus trees. Eucalyptus trees that aren't maintained can be um, very high fire dangers. They shed a lot. So they're constantly shedding leaves and bark on the ground, which is a receptive fuel source. Um, palm trees, we have a lot of palm trees and palm trees pose a big hazard because they are very receptive. They're very fibrous. So they, they when there's embers floating in the air, the palm trees, um, those embers will strike the palm tree and smolder in there until they get established and then you have a fire. And then that palm tree will then ignite and basically become a giant roaming candle and it will throw embers downstream. And I'm gonna play a quick video to kind of show you how fast a palm tree can catch fire and then spread embers to um, the surrounding area. So bear with me one second here while I load that video. So as you can see in that video, that was roughly two minutes and 10 seconds of video of a, of a palm tree on fire. And so that's a single palm tree. Luckily, where this was burning, somewhere in the city of Los Angeles, um, there was not a receptive fuel source for a lot of these fire brands or embers to fall into. So if you could imagine in a wind-driven wildfire, the moment we get some palm trees involved in fire, they're going to look very similar to this. And you see the amount of embers and debris that is blowing off of that palm tree. And like I said, that was only two minutes. That palm tree is going to continue to burn um, 
for quite a while. And in a wildfire, that palm tree is probably going to burn um, until it runs out of vegetation for it to burn. So it's going to continually cast all those embers downwind. And all it takes is for one of those embers to find one of those fuel sources that we're going to talk about right now on your structure. So when we look at our structure and where is a home visible, or I'm sorry, vulnerable to an ember attack, we look at the, ho the home itself and we see this structure with all of these different numbers going around the structure. And then we go, well, what, what, what does each one of those, those, those numbers correlate to? And so we'll go through it and we'll look at it. So, you know, number one on the structure itself is what type of roof material do we have on our structure? Um, you know, we, in, in our local area, most of our roofs are of a non-combustible type. So we either have asphalt shingles or we have concrete tile. Some of us have Spanish tile. And with each roof, there also are some pros and cons with it. So when we have Spanish tile and we have valleys in our roof, sometimes we have openings where debris can get up underneath our roof tiles. Um, so we want to check those areas out. This is an area that kind of gets overlooked. Uh, we do live in an area that is prone to wind. So we may not, or you may not have trees necessarily over your structure, but your neighbor does. And so I call it transient debris. It will get carried by our winds or our afternoon breezes and blow leaves and leaf litter, pine needles, and it'll accumulate in different valleys or crevices on your roof. So one thing I recommend is somebody gets up there um, several times a year and with a broom or a blower gets up there and just cleans that debris that's accumulating on the roof. We want to eliminate those sources of fuel for an ember to land on. So, and then we look at number two and we're talking about roof openings. So a lot of Spanish tile, because of its curvature, it's kind of open on the ends unless they fill it. Sometimes in the, in the Spanish look, they'll fill it with concrete. Other times um, we want to check and make sure we have what's called bird stop in there, which just prevents debris and leaf litter from getting up underneath the roof. Um, you know, number three is showing you those, those pine needle debris um, that can blow and accumulate up against your dormers or in the valley of your roof where the slope changes. Um, anywhere there you can find debris, um, that's just a potential ember source. And then four, we have skylights. So a lot of homes have skylights. This one here probably has what we'd call Lexan or a plexiglass bubble. Um, those are not as good as if you replace that with a tempered glass opening. It would just withstand a little bit more heat. The plastic in the event of a fire, if it was taking heat or you had some type of fire on the roof um, from debris, it could potentially melt. And then once you have that, the roof has been compromised. Now you have a, a spot where embers could directly um, penetrate into the, the structure itself. Uh, so if you have those one things that homeowners can look at is replacing those skylights that are plastic with energy efficient um, glass ones. And so number five, we have a spark arrestor on the top of our chimney. So we want to prevent those embers from going down into our chimney. Number six, we look at windows. So depending on when your home was built, you may already have double pane windows. Those are a little bit better than if you just had a single pane window. A uh, single pane window, if it took some, some flame or some heat, it could potentially crack or blow out. And then you'd have a direct path for embers into the structure. Um, you probably have ember, embers impacting your, your curtains or your, your couches on the inside. Um, so dual pane windows just offers you that that extra level of protection. Number seven is a big one, which is the vents on that. You see it here on the garage. And so a lot of us know those as gable vents. So our vents, we wanna make sure that our vents are covered. So it's recommended that you have one eighth inch wide mesh installed in your vents, or you can replace those vents. And there are several companies that make some uh, tested vents and they're, they're baffled and they also have a screen 
and they're designed for embers. Um, what the design of them is, is it allows the air to move in, but as the air moves in, it has to go through different chambers. And so if an ember were to penetrate it, that ember would have to go through those chambers. And every time it goes into a new chamber, it hits a new obstacle it has to get through, such as the screen. Eventually, when the air passes through it, the ember won't. Um, so number eight, we got rain gutters. So a lot of us have rain gutters on our home and it's kind of overlooked. And I notice it on a lot of my inspections that rain gutters are probably one of the, the biggest issues. So if you have your rain gutters that are open, you probably have a lot of transient debris that blows off the roof and accumulates in your rain gutter. And it's one of those things you can't really see. If you have any type of overhanging trees, such as a pepper tree or an oak tree, I guarantee there's quite a bit of debris down there in your gutters. And the reason that's important is that's a dried out fuel source for an ember to get established in. And then it is right up against and underneath your roof tiles in most cases and against your fascia board. And if it's allowed to free burn there, it can get established on the fascia and spread to the sub roof structure and then spread to the rest of the house. Some people have gone ahead and put screens over their gutters. That is good. You just need to make sure that those screens aren't acting as dams and catching the debris on top of it because some of the leaf or some of the leaf litter, some of the oaks get stuck in there. Pine needles get stuck through the, the openings and then they just create little dams. So you just get up there with a broom um, and sweep them off. If you don't have those, you can get up there with a, a leaf blower or they make some attachments that you can hook up to a garden hose to help clean those out. So nine, we move back to the, the actual siding of the structure. And what is our home actually made of? Um, we Ultimately, we wanna see some type of non-combustible material. So some of the older homes may have a wood siding and that's not something, you know, that's not the worst thing. Um, but as long as you're keeping that wood painted and treated, um, you're, you're doing good. What we don't want is to have a bunch of dried out cedar siding because um, that would be very receptive to an ember. But if you had wood siding and you're looking to make your home even harder, um, would recommend some type of concrete board, uh, a hardy board product or a non-combustible siding, uh, stucco, concrete, you know, something that doesn't um, burn like wood would uh, would be recommended. And then Wood pile. So this person has a wood pile. Um, we want to see the wood piles moved away from the structure, at least 30 feet from the structure, and then move, move it into an area where it's also just away from other combustible stuff. I've seen um, in some of our local areas, people use um, beautiful pine trees. So they use the one pine tree to the, to the next one on the right, and they'll fill it with firewood in the middle. And it's 15 feet away from their home. They've got the firewood away from the home, but they stack the firewood at the base of some trees, which would allow in a fire, if it took embers in the firewood, that's dried out wood ready to burn, it would just catch fire and then transition from there up into the trees, which is something that we really don't want. When we look at number 11, uh, can't really see it here on the map, it's in the backyard, that's patio furniture, right? So. One of the things that gets overlooked is you're going on vacation, you're going to be away for a few days, or it's just high fire danger, red flag days. We want to make sure that we move those combustible patio furniture cushions, move them into the garage or bring them in uh, side. If, if you're leaving town, grab those cushions and, and put them inside your sliding glass door so that they're not going to take embers if there were to be a fire. Okay, number 12, we're looking at deck boards on the on the patio. So we just want to make sure that our deck boards are in good shape, that they're not dried out. Um, the thicker the wood you put down, the better. Um, I always tell people when you go camping, you just can't take a, a lighter or a match and light a big log, right? We got to start small with our twigs, our twigs and our pine needles and work our way up to our big logs. The same concept with your house, your house being the big log. You can, it just doesn't catch fire instantaneously. Um, it, it takes those other um, things that will get it going. 
So we look at deck debris. We want to remove debris on the decks, um, anything that's flammable, maybe some potted plants. And I would even go as far sometimes as just looking at the rug selection that you have. Do you have a very fibrous rug on your front porch? If so, you might want to move it on high fire danger days. Under the deck is always important. Um, if you live in a high prone fired area like we are, probably want to put some type of siding that's non-combustible down there to pre prevent any embers from blowing underneath the deck. And, um, you know, maybe every, if you don't have that closed off, then maybe once a year getting a rake, getting out, getting all that debris underneath there. So that kind of covers both 13 and 14 and under the deck, 15, 16 flower boxes. It's just not recommended. We want to not have anything combustible within that first five feet. So if we have wooden flower boxes, look at remove them from, from the structure. Our flower beds, like we talked about, we want to, um, find other methods to plant there. If you're going to plant something, I would recommend like succulents and rocks. Those work very well. Um, but ultimately we want to see no flammable vegetation within that first five feet. Uh, vehicles. Vehicles are one of the things that I tell people all the time. We just have to be, you know, watching that, know where we live. Uh, we got a lot of canyons around here. We got a lot of commute, uh, people that commute. And then we don't have a lot of gas stations. And so one of the things I tell people is try to get in the habit of, you know, backing your car in so it's facing out, ready to get away. You'll see fire trucks always back in for that exact reason. Um, if you live up one of the canyons and it's high fire danger day, I try to get in the habit of never letting my vehicle go below half a tank just because if there were to be something that happens in the middle of the night and I've got to evacuate, the last thing I need to do is get in my car, get my family loaded in and look down and see the gas light come on and go, oh, darn, I need fuel. It's not open or there's no power at the gas station. So I always try to just get in the habit of when I park my car, back it in, make sure I always have more than a half a tank of fuel. Um, just kind of change your daily routine into to getting in that mindset. And it's one of those things that kind of comes naturally after that. So number 20 is we look at your garage and your garage door, right? So this one here has an open carport. So we just want to make sure that we're not collecting a bunch of debris in our carport. If we have a garage uh, in our garage door, we want to make sure that we have good weather stripping, good seals on the side of the garage door and on the very bottom of the door. Uh, if you're like me, your garage is full of things that are probably pretty flammable, boxes, storage, um, paint, uh, all the other things that we find in a garage that are easily ignitable. Moving on, we've got our garage trash cans and our recycling and green waste cans. If at all possible, we want to store those away from the structure. Um, and we want to make sure the lid is closed because the last thing we, really, we want to do is harden our home, eliminate the vegetation, move the firewood pile, but then leave our garbage cans with no lids on it right up against our structure to take an ember and catch fire. So if at all possible, find a new location to store your garbage cans away from the structure. And then last, we want to talk about wooden fences. Uh, a lot of us that, you know, live in areas that have fences, some of them are wooden. And I'm not saying that's bad, but what the program would like to see if you do have a wooden fence is somehow have a break in that wooden fence, whether it's a gate that's up against the structure, um, that would be fine. So that if you had a fire that got impacted or a fire was impacting your wooden fence, it would burn the wooden fence up to the point where it hit a non-combustible material, such as a, a, an iron gate, wrought iron gate, and that fence would burn. And it would not continue to burn until it got all the way up against the structure itself. So those are some of the things that, you know, we just want to make you aware of. There's a lot of things that as we go through the home hardening that, you know, homeowners can do. Homeowners can walk around their property and evaluate some of the things that we've pointed out. And some of them are very easy to do. Some of them are weekend projects. Other ones may be a little more um, you know, a bigger project that maybe you need to budget for. Um, maybe you need to 
You schedule a tree trimmer to come out and evaluate your trees or an arborist to come out and look at it, maybe make some of those selections. Um, and I understand that. Um, and that's something that we just, when we come out, we do these home ignition assessments. We really understand that, you know, each and every homeowner is in a different situation and each and every home is slightly different. So when it comes down to the home ignition zone assessments and really what the home ignition zone assessment is and then how to do it. So if you are interested, you can find out all the information yourself by going out and going to Google and Googling Cal Fire or DefensibleSpace.org and getting all this information. One of the wonderful great services that the city of Malibu offer to the residents of Malibu and some of the surrounding communities is an actual home ignition zone assessment performed by myself or the other fire liaison that we have, Gabe. We will come out to your home and meet with you and personally walk around your property, talk about the vulnerabilities that we see in your structure, your landscaping, and the topography and where your house lies, things that you can do to mitigate those. So to book one of those home ignition zone assessments, you would go to this webpage right here. So this is the city of Malibu. So www.malibucity.org slash fire safety. Once you get to the city of Malibu's web page, there's some great information on the left-hand side with fire weather, our CWPP 69 Bravo, some home fire safety tips, some home ignition zone assessment tab. You can do one of two things. You could click on the home ignition zone inspection tab and it'll bring you up information of what the home ignition zone assessment is. There's a great video going over a home ignition assessment from our former fire liaison, Jerry Vandermeulen. But most importantly, on the right-hand side of the screen, screen, there's this blue icon that says book an appointment. So from this web page, you would simply click on the book an appointment, wait for the page to load, and it's going to pop this up, this little message will tell you the first availability appointment and when it is. So because today's Thursday, it's going to generate this message that says the first available time slot is in four days. Simply hit OK. As you scroll down here, you will see the dates that are in bold and in black. Those are the dates that are available. You would simply click on a date, Monday the 13th. There's two openings on that day. There's a nine, nine to 11 or one to three. So I could take the nine. To, so that there's, I'm sorry, there's nine to 10. There's 11 to noon. There's one to two or three to four. So you just pick the slot that you wanted. You would fill out the information. You would send the request. It will then send a email to myself and it'll send an email to you scheduling the appointment. On that date and time, like I said, myself or Gabe, the other fire liaison, will come out to your home. We will meet with you. The whole process takes anywhere between 30 minutes and one hour, depending on the level of engagement and, and the size of the property that you want to go over. We'll answer any questions that you have. And then what we'll do is we will come back to the office and we'll generate a report if you want. If you want us to generate a report, we'll generate a report to you. And you can take that report and you can simply use it as a checklist. You can go down and you can just check things off as you accomplish them. Um, you can also use it to give to, um, you know, a handyman to say, hey, this is what he's recommended and go from there. So that is the home ignition zone assessment in a nutshell. So at this time, if we have any questions, we'll go ahead and go through that process. Sarah, did we get any in the chat? We did not. Uh, so there were no questions typed in the chat. However, I have given everyone the ability to unmute themselves. So if you have a question or would like to make a comment, you can raise your hand and be unmuted, or you can unmute yourself and um, we can get those questions going. I don't see any hands on my end. 
Does anyone have any questions um, or comments they would like to make? Now is the time. For those who are unfamiliar with Zoom, if you go to the lower left-hand side of the screen, there's a little microphone. Um, if it has a red line through it, a red slash, you are muted. If you would like to speak, you click on it and that red slash will go away and you can um, ask your question. I, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, um, sir. Yeah, if there, uh, there was a fire a while ago up Rambla and we slept through it and found out the next morning and I wanted to know the best way to be, to make sure we get notified of things going on. So from uh, Sarah, do you want to take the first part about that and explain what the city has? Sure, absolutely. So the city has uh, three level three levels of notification, and the one that we will be testing today, and the one that I strongly encourage everyone to sign up for, is the highest level of notification that we only use when there is an imminent threat to life, safety, and property, and that's called Everbridge. Um, Everbridge is a company that we contract with. It's a reverse 911 system. For those who have landlines in the city limits um, or have cell phones registered within the city limits of Malibu, we get that information uploaded automatically. However, I cannot strongly encourage enough. I know that's a lot of double negatives, but please, 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 please register yourselves um, and have each person in your home register individually. It's a somewhat smart system. So say I'm registering myself and I wanna include my spouse or my roommates and my children. The way the system works is it goes through your list of um, contact options. Please excuse me, my dog's about to start barking. I can see his posture. Um, and it'll first try your cell phone with a phone call and then a, a a text, and then it'll continue down until you respond. So that's why we try really hard to encourage everybody to register themselves individually. That way, uh, person A in the house gets one at the same time person B and person C, rather than having um, person A and then person B and then person C. The system is like I said, somewhat smart in the fact that if you respond or confirm to the message, it'll stop trying to contact you. Um, so I know there's a lot of information. I'll put the link in the chat for how you register for that. Um, the quick way is malibucity.org slash disaster notifications. Again, I'll put that in the chat. And we will be sending out a test message today to everyone who's registered within the city of Malibu. Um, around 4 p.m. If you don't receive it, please respond to, or please email or call me at public safety um, at malibucity.org or dial uh, 310 456 2489 uh, extension 368. And I will put all of that information in the chat as well. Thank you, Sarah. So the second half of that question would be, you know, how do you, how do you know about these fires um, when they start? So you have the city side of it that they do a great job of getting that information out. If you wanted to bombard yourself with information, there is an app that is available on the Android and iOS for the iPhones called Pulse Point, where you could download the app and internally in the app, you would set what you want to get alerts for. And the Los Angeles County Fire Department, who provides our fire protection out here, you would want to select Division 7. But when you do that, you're going to get a, an alert. If you select wildfires, you're going to get a, an alert, a text message sent to your phone at any hour of the day, all night long, whenever there's a reported vegetation fire. So you can go in there in the app and select what you want to be notified for. Um, so for an example, in the middle of this Zoom call, it went off for a reported vegetation fire at Westward Beach in Malibu. So anytime the fire department dispatches the call, you will get a text message. 
it may not be in Malibu. It may be in Santa Monica area, or it may be West Hollywood or anywhere. Division seven extends all the way to the 210 freeway in, in uh, Tahunga area. So you'll get those alerts as well. Um, so it's just a dep depends on how much information you want to get and you want to process. If you wanted to stick to Malibu only, I would just stick with the um, messaging that Sarah just referred to. So I hope that answers your question, Ramsey. Oh, you're muted yes. still. There you go. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, no problem. Kim, do you want to go ahead and, and go next? Yeah, hey, thanks. Um, question for, I've got a home that has open eaves. Okay. So I've done the kind of clear a lot of the vegetation around and have, you know, pretty good open area there. But I do have the open eaves and wanted to just kind of understand, like, um, that's a bigger project to try to fix. Um, and then what you do in terms of like materials and do you need permits for it? And how, how, how would you go about addressing that if you wanted to take it on as a project? So, yeah, so um, that's a little bit bigger of a project when it comes to the exposed eaves. If you wanted to, they, the term used is box in the eaves. Um, you'd want to pull a permit. Um, it's something if you're going to try to tackle it yourself or hire a contractor for that would just be a decision you'd have to make depending on your level of, you know, comfort working on your homes. Um, depending on the home without seeing it, some of the construction on it is um, a little bit easier to do it because maybe they ran the, um, depending on how they did it, the, the rafter joist could come all the way out and meet the fascia board, which would then give you a good nailing surface for your, to box in your eaves. And you'd have a couple of options doing it. I would just highly recommend when you do it, that um, you're doing it with like a non-combustible product, such as like a hardy board, um, which is a concrete board that kind of looks like wood siding. The other option, depending on your home, if you had a stucco or concrete sided home, uh, it can also be boxed in utilizing those same construction methods. So they would just box it in with plywood and then they'd put the, um, the chicken wire up there and the scratch coat and then the, the final coat of stucco underneath it. Um, I would recommend that you have box and eaves living in this general area. We are within the high fire severity zone and, you know, anything that you can do to increase your home survivability is great. Um, and any home that is built with new construction now, that is a requirement because we have seen the benefits of it. So um, uh, did I answer your question? Yeah, and I had somebody else kind of mention to me, kind of watch the, the point where the stucco meets where the overhang starts that mm -hmm. I guess if, if I didn't do the boxing in they said well at a minimum go around and just be sure you don't have any gaps in that connection point is that I mean I've done that part of it but the trying to figure out the how much to budget even like just on a per square foot to do the boxing has been the a little bit of a challenge too yeah you know? it's one of those things where you can you can do a lot with your your eaves that are exposed um and if you're very handy I would highly recommend getting a couple tubes of caulking and some paint and go around and all the little joints inside there where the rafter tail comes out um, is run a bead of caulking along there to eliminate any of those little cracks because those little cracks where an ember can get into and that wood is pretty dry there. And so you just want to close those off and not allow any of the embers to get in there. So if you just go around with painter's caulk and then paint the underside of the eaves, um, you should be okay. So it's not a special caulking product. It's just a regular. No, you just want to use an, uh, uh, you could just use a painter's caulk to caulk up an exterior grade. It's going to go outside um, to just seal those off and then paint over it. And basically an ember is going to just kind of hit and the wind's going to blow it right off. It just doesn't have that ability to go in there and, and stick and wedge itself between those two pieces of wood. Got it. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? I'll also be sending out a follow-up email from the public safety um, email with the links to the YouTube videos that Chris showed today, a link to the fire safety page and a link to the, um, the a direct link to registering for the home ignition zone assessment and links to the alerting page.
Yeah, and just to close, since we don't have any other questions, for those of you that are on here, I, I would highly recommend just going on there and scheduling the home ignition zone assessment. You can pick a date and time of your choosing that works for you. Uh, it's really great information. I recognize one of the faces here um, today watching this that just recently had a home ignition zone assessment done. And so it's just another just great information. And it, it's even if you are watching the videos and you think you have a good idea, maybe you're missing something that, you know, either Gabe or myself can easily identify and, and give you some ideas of some, um, for lack of a better way of saying it, some low hanging fruit that you can just pick this year and run with those projects and get them done next weekend. So that's all I have, Sarah. If nobody else has any questions, we can conclude the webinar. So again, last chance folks. Um, I did CC the public safety uh, email, which is a direct link to both Chris and Gabe when I sent out the Zoom link from uh, the pub, uh, public safety email. So if you guys decide you have questions later, feel free to reach out to us, but um, give it a quick 30 seconds to see if anybody else has any questions. If not, we will uh, end it here. Thank you, Chris, for all your acknowledgement and for really stepping up to the plate and informing us of what's the right thing to do and what's future. Oh, no problem. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to help anybody out. I think that just about does it. Again, thank you all for coming. I hope you found this informative and useful. Uh, look for a follow-up email sometime today. And as a final reminder, the city will be sending out an Everbridge test message today around 4 p.m. If you do not receive it, uh, please reach out to me at the public safety email or call me at 310-456-2489, extension 368, and we'll see what happened and get you sorted. Other than that, thank you so much, everyone, for attending, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you.